good afternoon everyone and uh, i am prachi pasalkar on behalf of pune knowledge cluster i will, and uh, co data national committee and uh, insa indian national science in uh, science academy i welcome all of you uh, to this talk today on uh, big data and the square kilometer array telescope by professor yogesh uh, i now welcome uh, professor ajit kembavi Professor Kembavi is uh, the principal investigator of the Pune Knowledge Cluster and the chairman of the CoData National Committee, and he is a renowned uh, astrophysicist. Over to you, sir, uh, for your inaugural remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, Prachi. So th this is a series of uh, data-related lectures that we have been organizing uh, on behalf of CoData National Committee as well as TKC and uh, INSA. So uh, the previous talk here on this, the last talk was on COVID data, and here's a big jump to radio astronomical data and astronomical data in general. So uh, I am the chairperson for the meeting today is Professor G C Anupama, and I'm very happy to introduce her to you. And she's the president of the uh, in, uh, Astronomical Society of India. And until very recently, she was a senior professor and dean at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, where she continues to be a visiting professor now. And uh, Professor Anupama uh, has worked on a great many things over a long and very illustrious astronomical career. Uh, but for the last decade or so, she has been concerned mainly with transient objects. So, for example, if you had a gamma ray burst, then to try to find its counterpart. Or if you have got uh, a gravitational uh, uh, wave burst and then try to find the counterpart of that or study supernovae. She has been leading what is known as the growth project, which involves uh, an array of uh, uh, telescopes all over the world. One of which is at the uh, site of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Ladakh at Hanle. And this project is led by Anupama and, uh, and uh, also Varun Malerao. Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai um, and uh, Suhan So uh, now I request Anupama uh, to kindly request uh, to introduce the speaker and then to chair the session. Anupama? Yeah, uh, sorry, I was not able to unmute myself. Okay. Yeah, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce today's uh, speaker, Dr. Yogesh Vadadekar. Um, it's particularly a pleasure for me since Yogesh was uh, one of my very early summer project uh, students. And, uh, you know, he's really grown on from then. Yogesh obtained his BTEC degree from IIT Bombay in 1994. And he obtained his PhD from uh, Ayuka in Pune in 2001. Uh, thereafter, he was a postdoc at the um, Institute d'Astrophysique in uh, Paris, France, and also at the Space Science, um, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, in USA. In 2006, he took up the position of the um, as an astronomical software scientist with the Slow and Digital Sky Survey at Princeton University in US. And um, in late 2007, he moved back to um, India and uh, joined at the National Center for Radio Astrophysics of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in, in Pune. And Yogesh has been at NCRA since then. Uh, his research in interests span many aspects of galaxy um, evolution as traced by their observations in the ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and the radio bands. So essentially, he does multi-wavelength uh, observations and analysis of multi-wavelength data. And he uses both uh, ground-based as well as space-based telescopes. He's also very much interested in the application of machine learning techniques to astronomical problems and in the design of uh, complex control systems for large radio telescopes. He has been involved with the design and construction of monitoring and control system of the square kilometer um, array uh, since 2010. 
And uh, today he will be talking about the big data that you, um, you know, expect to get from the square kilometer um, array. So over to you, Yogesh. Well, thank you, Professor Anupama for the kind introduction. Indeed, my journey in astronomy towards becoming a professional astronomer started more than 28 years ago in the summer of 1993, when I was a vacation student program uh, student at Ayuka under the supervision of uh, Professor Anupama. And uh, it's really nice for me to be giving this talk where she's introducing me. And the other person uh, present is Professor Kembhavi, who was, of course, my thesis advisor when I did my PhD at Ayuka. So let's get started. I'm going to be talking today on this topic called Big Data and the Square Kilometer Array Telescope. So before we begin, I'll spend a few minutes setting the context of what, why we want to study and what we want to study when we say we want to study the universe. We now believe that the universe uh, began in what we refer to as the Big Bang about 13.7 billion years ago. At that time, everything in the universe was ju just one hot plasma. There were no at atoms and molecules as we know them today. But as the universe expanded uh, from that Big Bang, it cooled enough and about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, it had cooled to a level where electrons and protons could come together and form hydrogen atoms. Uh, these, uh, once the hydrogen atoms formed, nothing much happened for about 400 million years. And then eventually the hydrogen uh, condensed, uh, came together, uh, reached very high densities, temperatures and pressures that allowed nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium to start in the course of the first stars. Thereafter, these stars continued to evolve and these stars formed large agglomerations, which we now see today as galaxies. Astronomers want to study the universe. And what do they do when they study the universe? They use astrophysics uh, to study the universe. And astrophysics is simply the application of the laws of physics to the study of everything there is in the universe. So astronomers like to study the sun, they like to study the planets, they like to study other objects in our solar system like asteroids, comets, dwarf planets, etc. Then they'd like to study stars in their various flavors, low mass, very low mass stars, failed stars called brown dwarfs, very evolved stars like white dwarfs, neutron stars, which also manifest in the radio as pulsars, and of course black holes and highly evolved stars like giant and supergiant stars. They like to study the planets that go around these stars. They like to study the stuff that lies in between the stars. They like to study the galaxies in which these stars reside and the galaxies themselves cluster together to form galaxy groups and galaxy clusters. There are some galaxies which we refer to as active galaxies. So that one flavor of active galaxy are the quasars. Uh, astronomers study the stuff, the, the material that lies in between galaxies. They study the very distant universe in the form of the cosmic microwave background. They study the universe not only with light, but nowadays with newer ways of studying the universe like gravitational waves. They study mysterious and hitherto ill understood phenomena like dark matter and dark energy and they try to study what happened during the Big Bang itself. And while doing this on the side, they're also trying to see if there are any aliens that we can make contact with. And why does this approach even work? So Albert Einstein once made the statement that the most inexplicable thing about the universe that it is explicable. It seems almost unreasonable that a universe of such scale and complexity can be fathomed by the human mind. And the reason it can be done is because as far as we can tell, the laws of physics are universally applicable, which means the laws of physics, Newton's laws of physics or Einstein's theory of gravitation, which we know, which we have experimentally verified in, in our local uh, uh, laboratories, actually works the same way, the exact same way in the distant universe. 
So, so although there are still a large number of unsolved problems in astrophysics, there has been simultaneously a lot of progress in our understanding of the universe. Astronomical data is special in one other way. It's of course very large in size, but there are other databases or uh, data sets uh, uh, in, in, in our, on earth that are much larger than this. One thing that makes astronomy data special is that unlike most other fields, like for example, medical research, astronomical data has no immediate economic value. And therefore, this data becomes, it becomes possible to share these data freely, and they are indeed shared freely internationally. And in, while doing this, a lot of effort therefore needs to uh, go into making these data from telescopes accessible to everyone in a very well-defined format. And when you do that, you try to follow what are called the FAIR principles. You make sure the data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And in order to enable that, astronomers have developed a set of standards, which are the virtual observatory standards, and they need to be followed strictly uh, to make sure that the data is fair. Much of our understanding of the universe today has come from studies of light that is, em that is emitted by celestial sources. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum or light uh, as we know it uh, consists not just of visible light or familiar colors from red to violet, which form a very, very tiny part of the visible spectrum. At, at longer wavelengths, you have the radio waves and uh, within the radio waves, you have a lot of man-made radio waves. For example, our cell phones work on radio, our TV channels are radio, our FM radio is, uh, is radio and so on. This is on frequencies ranging from a, a few tens of megahertz to a few tens of gigahertz. So that's about three orders of magnitude in frequency. Because this is the frequency range uh, that radio astronomers use today in order to study the universe. So how does a radio telescope work? So in a radio telescope, you, uh, you receive, you have some, some kind of receptor. It could be as simple as a dipole antenna and that will receive uh, uh, this electromagnetic radio wave that is coming from the celestial source and that's going to induce a voltage in your antenna. That voltage will have the same frequency as the frequency of the incoming uh, radio wave. Uh, we will refer to that as new RF, new radio frequency. We take that radio frequency and we amplify it in an RF amplifier. Then we have uh, a device known as a mixer, which combines the signal from the, the radio signal along with uh, artificially produced signal in our local oscillator, mixes it, and uh, the output of that is a somewhat lower frequency, an intermediate frequency, which can be further amplified and possibly transported to other locations where it can be mis uh, mixed again with another local oscillator. And the frequency that you get from there is known as the baseband frequency. So the signal that you have received uh, with your uh, dipole receiver is then recorded on what we call as the back end. This is what uh, a radio dish, a uh, single radio dish functions as. Those of you who have studied some electronics uh, in your high school or in your college uh, will recognize this block diagram as being very similar to what you have for a transistor radio. So in some sense, a single radio dish is at its core nothing but a fancy transistor radio. But in radio astronomy, we often don't use single dishes. We, we have multiple dishes, multiple receptors whose signal we combine together. So what you see here is, our, is the simplest uh, radio interferometer. 
there are two receivers, one on the right, which is uh, shown as uh, V1T, and another on the left, which is known as V2T. And imagine a radio wave, which is coming in, in uh, from the top right, and uh, it'll come in, it's a plain uh, wave, it's going to hit the receiver uh, new one uh, at some point. And then some time later, because there's an extra path length that it has to travel, that extra path length is V sine theta from simple trigonometry. And of course, radio waves travel at the speed of light. So it's going to take an extra time V sine theta over C in order to reach the second uh, receiver. And one can then take the voltages that are induced in, uh, in V1 and V2 and combine them together in a specific way, which I won't get into, uh, in a device known as a correlator. And then the correlated outputs can then be stored uh, on a computer uh, for further processing. What radio telescopes, what radio interferometers do is that they don't give you a direct image of the sky. What they give you is the Fourier transform of the intensity on the sky. If, so it, this is a, a two element interferometer has many analogies to the Young's double slit experiment, which you must have done in your high school or college. And there you, you, you know that if the separation between the slits increases, the uh, uh, separation between the fringes decreases. This exact same thing happens here. Uh, every pair of antennas, so every yellow dot spot that you see here, imagine that's a radio dish and you can take any two two radio dishes and look at the fringes produced between them. And uh, those fringes uh, will be close to each other when the dishes are widely separated. Those uh, fringes will be far away from each other when the dishes are close by. Uh, there's one more thing that happens uh, is that as the earth rotates, uh, these fringes uh, will begin to rotate themselves. Uh, uh, along as the as the angle of the baseline as seen from the radio source changes as a function of time. So given a long enough observation, we refer to this as a full synthesis observation, given a long enough observation, it becomes possible to sample the Fourier plane uh, of uh, which is the Fourier transform of the intensity of the sky uh, reasonably completely so that you can take eventually an inverse Fourier transform and recreate the, the radio image. Radio interferometers over the last uh, seven decades or so have been built in many countries of the world. I show here three of the largest ones. So there is the low frequency array or low far, uh, which is uh, again a very large interferometer. What you see here within that circle are little black markings, uh, which represent the dipoles of the LOFAR uh, antenna clustered together to form one station. And what you see here are several stations which form the core of the LOFAR. The telescope itself is very large and is spread across, has receivers, receptors spread across several countries in Europe. On top right, you see the Jansky Very Large Array Telescope located in the United States. That is a more conventional uh, radio dish. Uh, these radio, each of these radio dishes is mounted on railway tracks so that you can move the dishes along those railway tracks and you can increase or decrease the separation between the dishes and thereby control the resolution that you can attain with the telescope. This is a very large uh, uh, telescope, about 40 years old, and has been uh, doing excellent science uh, at somewhat higher radio frequencies. In the frequency range lying between LOFAR and the Jansky VLA, uh, in that niche is India's uh, giant meter wave radio telescope, uh, which is located about 80 kilometers uh, north of Pune city. It consists of 30 dishes of 45 meter, fully steerable dishes of 45 meter diameter each. You are seeing three of those dishes uh, in this picture. Between them, these three telescopes uh, cover a fairly wide range of radio frequencies and are amongst the largest and most sensitive telescopes in the world. 
at much higher radio frequencies, the submillimeter and the millimeter uh, wavelengths, uh, there is at a very high plateau at 5,000 meters uh, altitude uh, in Chile, uh, there is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Uh, you can see some of the dishes of the ALMA uh, in this picture. There are also two new telescopes uh, that have been uh, commissioned in the last few years. On, uh, on the left, you see the Meerkat telescope, which is located in South Africa, and uh, which consists of a number of dishes. Uh, on the uh, top right, on the right panel, you see a telescope known as the ASCAP. ASCAP stands for the uh, Australian SK Pathfinder, and that telescope was built just to uh, prove some of the technologies that will be used in the telescope that we are going to talk about today, which is the square kilometer array. So the square kilometer array is actually two telescopes in two different locations. Originally, it was thought that both, both these uh, kinds of telescopes will be housed in one location. And two sites were shortlisted uh, about uh, 15 years ago. And uh, the two sites, there was one in South Africa and one in the desert of Western Australia. Uh, however, it, for various reasons, uh, technical and non-technical, uh, eventually it was decided that two telescopes would be built. Uh, the dish-based telescope, uh, which you see in the left picture, uh, which would operate at somewhat higher frequencies, uh, would be based out of a site in South Africa. And uh, the telescope that you see on the right, which is the dipole array, uh, a sparse dipole array that uh, uh, would be just a network of many, many thousands of uh, dipole antennas connected together uh, into a network, uh, would, be, would form a second telescope, which would be located in the desert in Western Australia at the same site which houses the ASCAP telescope, which I showed you in the previous slide. Over the last 30 years, the SK project has been, uh, has been going on in, in various avatars. Uh, what we have currently uh, is a fair, a complete detailed design uh, which is completely ready. And in July of this year, uh, construction of the telescope has already started. Construction of each of those two telescopes, one a dish-based telescope in South Africa and a dipole array-based telescope and aperture, sparse aperture array in Australia. It was quickly realized that the original dream of building a square kilometer array uh, could not be realized immediately for, for technical reasons as well as economic reasons. Uh, SKA stands for square kilometer array. Uh, what that means is that the eventual telescope that will be built will have a total collecting area of one square kilometer. Uh, it was decided about five or six years ago that it would be, it would not be feasible to try and build out the full SK at this time. So what was done was uh, they made an SK phase one and an SK phase two. The SK phase one will be roughly 10% of the final telescope. Uh, the phase two will be uh, taken up after phase one is built. This is going to take a really long time because the phase one itself is going to take about eight years to construct. We've just started construction and it's going to take eight years till it's completed. So it's very likely that the phase two will not appear on the scene at least to the end of the 2030s, if not in the 2040s. But I'm not going to try and show you a short video, uh, which will really set the stage for you uh, for uh, what the SK will look like. Uh, I would caution you that this video was made about 10 years ago. Uh, at that time, the decision to house the telescope in different sites, uh, one in South Africa and one in Australia, had not yet been taken. 
and therefore this the video will show you both the telescopes in one side in fact it will show you three telescopes in one side because in sk phase two there is a plan to build a third telescope which is the dense aperture array so what i will do now is uh, i will play this video and i will uh, as the video plays i'm going to uh, describe to you uh, what the telescope is all about So what you see here is a set of dishes. Each dish is 15 meters in diameter. And in the full SK, there will be about three and a half thousand such dishes. For the phase one, we are only building about 200. So it's not even, uh, not even 10%. But in the full SK, as you see here, about half the dishes will be distributed over an area which is uh, uh, about five kilometers in diameter and each dish will be independently steerable it will be able to uh, point to any radio source in the sky and track it as the earth rotates it will be able to follow the radio source as it moves uh, in the sky so these dishes form one one telescope and then there is the sparse uh, aperture array, which is this collection of very large number of dipole antennas, uh, uh, each of which is receiving the radio signal and each of which is transmitting the radio signal to a station uh, beam former where the, the data are combined in some fashion and then transported further. This is the third telescope, uh, the dense aperture array that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, the dense aperture array stations will be like these white circles that you see. Uh, these, this telescope uh, configuration will not be built uh, at the present time. It will only come in phase two. But this is just the beginning. This is just the core of the square kilometer array. Uh, there are going to be a large number of stations that are located at uh, larger and larger distances from the telescope core. So we are traveling along one of the arms, we've come to about uh, 200 kilometers. And as you zoom out, the distance from the core keeps on increasing. And in the SK phase two, uh, one will have uh, the, the, uh, the most distant dishes and arrays located about 3000 kilometers uh, 3,000 kilometers away. I'm sorry. We are not able to see the full screen. So as you must have realized from watching this video, the SK telescope has a scale and complexity far higher than anything that astronomers have built so far. Just to describe the telescope in great detail so that we can have a blueprint uh, from which we can build out the telescope required about 20,000 pages of documentation. So there is 20,000 pages of detailed design describing the system. In this talk, I'm going to uh, beyond this at this point from this point forward, going to focus on a very limited aspect of the telescope. 
I will talk about some of the challenges that we face in the software and computing domain, uh, ignoring all the other aspects. Okay, but if you want to learn more, I urge you to visit the SK website, uh, www.sktelescope.org, uh, which contains a lot of details about the telescope. So how is the SK going to be better? Okay, so at top left, uh, there is a figure which shows you what the sensitivity of the SK phase one and phase two uh, will be as a function of frequency. So you see below, uh, there is the LOFAR, the UGMRT and the JBLA telescopes. Uh, and the SK phase one will improve uh, on the best sensitivities available today by a factor of between four and 20, uh, depending on the frequency. At bottom right, you see uh, another metric, which is how fast can we carry out a survey of the radio sky. Uh, if you take that as a metric, uh, of course, to a given sensitivity, if you take that as a metric, then the survey speed is going to be between 10 and 100 times larger than what can be achieved with the best current generation telescopes like LOFAR, GMRT, or the BLA. Uh, as I already told you, there are two telescopes at two sites. Uh, the SK low uh, will operate between 50 and 350 megahertz. Uh, it's going to be located in the desert in Western Australia. Uh, it's going to have 131,000 uh, dipoles spread across uh, 65 uh, kilometers. Uh, so not as large as the phase two, but still significantly large. The site is very remote. The Australian site is particularly remote. Uh, there you measure population density of people, not in terms of people per square kilometer, but in terms of uh, kilometer, square kilometers per person. And here you have more than 500 uh, square kilometers per person. So you have to cover an area of 500 square kilometers before you find uh, one person on average. Very, very sparsely populated region, about 800 kilometers uh, northeast of Perth. Uh, the SK mid telescope, which is based on the dishes, will be lo located at the Meerkat site. Uh, it will operate uh, at frequencies between 350 megahertz and about 15.3 gigahertz. Uh, in the phase one, there will be about 215 uh, meter dishes spread across. So the largest distance from the core uh, of the dish is going to be about 150 kilometers. Construction started on July 1st this year. <coughs> it's going to take a long time. In about eight years uh, is when we expect with some, some small amount of contingency time, that the construction of the telescope will be completed. It's going to be very expensive. Uh, it's the estimated cost of construction at the present time is about 2000 uh, million euros at, uh, at 2020 prices. Needless to say, a project as large as this one cannot be ac accomplished without international collaboration. And the SK has been an international project from the very beginning. Uh, there are most of the countries of Western Europe are, invo are involved. Of course, the two side countries, South Africa and Australia are also involved. In addition to that, we have Canada, uh, India and China who have been involved for many years. And more recently, uh, two Far Eastern countries, South Korea and Japan have also uh, expressed an interest in joining the project. Besides these partner countries, which are shown in light blue, there are also some uh, African partner countries, uh, which are shown in dark blue, uh, countries like uh, Kenya and Ghana and Mozambique and Madagascar and so on. Building a telescope of this size will naturally require a large team. You require engineers, you require astronomers, you require managers, and hundreds of people have contributed uh, 
to the detailed design of the SK telescope, uh, which started in about 2013 and concluded in about 2019. And this is uh, a, a photograph taken at one of the last S large SK meetings that we had, uh, an all hands engineering meeting, uh, which was held uh, in Shanghai in 2019. The work of design the SK between 2013 and 2019 uh, was done uh, with through a large number of design consortia. Uh, there was one uh, which is uh, put in the marked in red over here, which is called Telescope Manager, uh, which was uh, an effort to build the monitoring and control system for the telescope, uh, the software for that which was led by, uh, by India and particularly by us at the National Center for Radio Astrophysics. The SK will enable a wide variety of science because it's such, uh, it's going to explore parameter space that has never been explored before. Uh, it will enable studies of the early universe, it will enable new tests of general relativity, it enable studies of cosmic magnetism and cosmology, and galaxies, and of course, phenomena, exploration of the unknown that we have not yet encountered. <clears throat> How much better will it be? It will be significantly better. So what you see here on the left is an image of a galaxy obtained with the VLA telescope in four different configurations. Uh, so this is an actual image that has been obtained. And what you see on the right is the simulated image of the same galaxy as seen with a long observation made with the square kilometer array. So you can see that there's going to be a very, very dramatic increase uh, in the sensitivity, the resolution and the overall quality of the uh, radio images. The telescope that we built, the telescope manager that we built is forms the nervous system of the, of the telescope. And because of that, it needs to interface with almost everything in the telescope. It needs to talk to the hardware, to the dishes and aperture arrays, make sure they're working properly. It needs to commandeer them to carry out the observation that we wish to carry out. It needs to make sure that the signals that are received by the receptors are correctly recorded and transported uh, for further processing. It needs to talk to the central signal processor, which is uh, a, a very large correlator, uh, which is combining the signals that is coming in from the various receptors. Uh, it needs to incorporate the precursors, so the Mirkat telescope and the S, uh, and uh, will be absorbed into the SK mid telescope. It needs to be uh, done correctly and smoothly. Uh, it needs to interface with the infrastructure that you have at the telescope site. It needs to interface with the supercomputer which forms the science data processing center. And it needs to do all of this while providing custom user interfaces to all the users of the telescope. So you will have operators who want to run the telescope. You will have astronomers who are just interested in the data that they're gathering from the telescope. You will have engineers who will be ensuring that the telescope is running optimally and who will be coming in and fixing problems as and when they are found. So it's going to be a very, very complex system uh, which needs to be engineered. So what will the telescope manager do? Uh, the telescope manager, even if before it begins observation, is going to accept a large number of science proposals, is going to design how the observations are to be carried out, is going to schedule them, and it will make sure that the telescope is ready to carry out the observation. And then when the actual observation starts, the telescope manager has to orchestrate the entire hardware and software systems to control the observations uh, through well-defined interfaces. Of course, things will go wrong. There will be alarms going off. There will be faults. And the telescope manager has to have an ability to diagnose and then help the maintenance engineers uh, fix those faults. The 
there's going to be a lot of operational support data it facilitates uh, uh, the telescope maintenance of the telescope systems through the logging of parameters which will monitor the telescope health and evaluate any conditions that will impact the observations and then in, of course it will based on the uh, telescope metadata that is archived it will enable uh, the performance of diagnostic tests so that maintenance engineers can fix the problems that they find. Uh, India has led the design of this throughout the design uh, detailed design phase. Uh, there is the telescope itself is very distributed in a very sparsely populated area. There are huge data flows and complicated signal and image processing. We'll come to that in a few minutes. And this requires a fairly sophisticated system for monitoring and control. Uh, India led this international consortium and we did this in partnership with large uh, software industry partners, which included uh, Tata in, uh, Consultancy Services and Persistent Systems, uh, who worked with us during the detailed design. What this work was done in collaboration with industry, more in a collaborative fashion, not as a purely commercial contract. And this engagement over the last seven or eight years has enabled us to build a strong and vibrant industry interaction model, which we hope will benefit India and the SKA in the construction of the observation management and control package. Indian industry has also found the experience of working in this domain quite interesting. Uh, there is the possibility of using the skills and the knowledge gained while designing a radio telescope uh, in other domains and uh, this we are already seeing the benefits from that because a number of experts uh, from Indian in industry are now playing important roles, uh, uh, senior roles in the SKO software work. So why is the SKA difficult? Of course, you have to orchestrate so many different thousands of different dishes or hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, dipole arrays, combine the signal together and process it and so on. What makes the SKA unique are the data flow rates, which are enormous. So within the one station, which is the dipole, it's a collection of dipole arrays, the data that needs to be moved is about 1.7 petabits a second. But of course, you can't transport so much data with large distances. So at the core of each station, there will be what we call as a station beamformer, which will process uh, that data and reduce it to about uh, 5.8 terabits per second. That data then gets transported to the SK1 low uh, uh, correlator, uh, which further processes it uh, creates uh, visibility data, but still spits out six terabits per second. In the SKA mid telescope, which is located in South Africa, the raw data rates are about nine terabits per second coming in from all the dishes. These go into the SKA one mid correlator and that spits out data at the rate of uh, 6.8 terabits per second. The data that comes out of the Australian telescope is transported over optical fiber to Perth, where is there is a large uh, HPC, high performance computing unit, which will ingest all that data at six terabits per second, process it, of course, reduce it further. Uh, in, in South Africa, you have uh, similarly a science data processing center in Perth, which will ingest all that 6.8 terabits uh, per second of data that is coming in from the SKM one mid telescope and process it further. You need to do that because you're talking of at 6. Point, uh, uh, at, at, let's say 12 terabits per second, you are talking of over 50,000 petabytes per year. Okay, So obviously we can't store that data, we can't use that data. So what, uh, what is going to be done is that they will be processed, not in true real time, but in quasi real time. So within a few hours of the data getting ingested, uh, it will get processed 
and then the process data gets transported uh, to what is known as, as the SK regional centers. And it is through these SK regional centers is when users will access that data. This is a view of the science data processor. Uh, it's going to be talking closely with the telescope manager uh, with which it is going to be continuously exchanging information. Uh, this may be simple control and monitoring data, or it could be some detailed information about the exact state of the telescope, about alarms, about the calibration model, and so on. The science data processor also needs to talk uh, to uh, the central signal processor, which is going to process the science signals uh, and deliver uh, the inputs uh, that the science data processing system needs to process. And the science data processor is basically a very large uh, uh, compute box. I will talk, talk a little bit uh, about uh, the specifications of the science data processor in a few minutes. But once the science data processing is done, uh, the processed outputs uh, need to flow out uh, of the science data processor uh, to the SK observatory and then further downstream into the SK regional centers. So here is another view of uh, the science data flow uh, of the science data processor. Uh, it ingests a lot of data that is coming in from the correlator. It has primarily two kinds of pipelines, one for uh, interferometric data, which we refer to as the visibility pipeline, and also for observations of uh, in the time domain, particularly of objects like pulsars, uh, there is a separate pipeline, which is known as the uh, time domain pipeline. The outputs of the science data processing flow into the science archive and then into a long-term archive and then also into the delivery system, uh, which will deliver all of these processed outputs uh, to a mirror archive and also to a network of uh, SK regional centers, which are primarily data centers that are distributed all over the world from where the scientists will access the SK data. So here's the architecture. So you have the two telescopes, SK1 low and SK1 mid, uh, that is going to deliver uh, data to a number of SK regional centers. The regional centers will distribute the data between them, but when you make it accessible to users, that is going to be made accessible through a common science platform. So the users don't care whether their uh, data are sitting in a data center in China or in India or in Europe. They're going to access a common platform, just like we log into our Gmail accounts uh, from anywhere. They log into a common science platform. They'll be able to uh, search data, which is located in multiple SRCs. And then they will even be able to process data that is sitting in those SRCs. Uh, process it together and the uh, essential movement of data the, that is required will be done uh, seamlessly to the user. So the user community is therefore facilitated by, uh, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by this seamless access to the worldwide SRC. Nevertheless, they may need some support, uh, some physical support, some support with the codes, analysis codes that they're writing and so on. So the SRCs in the different regions will also provide expertise, people who will be able to support the scientist in this effort. So how will these regional centers be distributed? So this is a map which shows the rough layout of the proposed uh, SK regional center network. <coughs> so there will be one regional center in the host countries in South Africa and Australia. And uh, there will be likely four more, uh, one each in China, one in India, uh, one in Europe, and one in Canada. These have to be connected with very fast uh, internet connections. We are talking of 100 gigabit per second dedicated point-to-point -point connections between the SRCs, because that is what is going to enable uh, them to transport data between themselves and between the telescope sites at very high speeds.
So what, what will the regional centers provide? They'll provide capacity resources for reprocessing data and for data analysis. They will provide storage for a long-term archive and they'll provide, as I said, local or regional uh, user support. These could be hosted by existing national supercomputing centers, but these could also be hosted by uh, a new data center uh, built specifically for hosting SKA data. They will also have some number of people employed who will be responsible for developing new analysis pipelines, new techniques, uh, new algorithms for analysis of the SKA data. And these are the people who are charged with enabling the delivery of the white science that is expected to be carried out by thousands of astronomers across the world. For the science data processor, uh, this is the kind of computing requirement that we are talking of. About 25 petaflops per second total sustain and about 200 petabytes per second aggregate bandwidth to, to fast working memory. Uh, we need 50 petabyte uh, uh, fast working storage to be available and we need to be able to do one terabyte per second sustained write to storage and 10 terabytes per second sustained uh, read from storage and this is asymmetric because as the data get pro gets processed uh, the volume of the data set is expected to uh, become smaller uh, we will have to do a number of read write operations from the storage, uh, but we'll also have to do a very large number of uh, floating point operations once we uh, read in a byte of data. So typically, because many of the data processing steps uh, in radio astronomy are iterative in nature, we will need to process every byte uh, uh, through about 10,000 uh, floating point operations. And all of this has to be done uh, within five megawatts megawatts of power consumption at each site at Perth and at Cape Town. The computing challenges uh, of uh, of SK data are driven primarily by uh, their rather different arithmetic intensity. So arithmetic intensity rho is defined as the total floating point operations per second that you carry out divided by the total uh, DRAM bytes that you have. So the principal algorithms required by SDP, which are gridding and fast Fourier transforms, typically have a row of only 0.5. Okay? Whereas typical accelerators uh, like uh, GPU accelerators like the NVIDIA Pascal uh, have an accelerator, uh, have a row arithmetic intensity of about five. So here's a little calculation which told, tells you that uh, for the memory bandwidth that's available with NVIDIA Pascal and uh, the floating point bandwidth that's available, if you use an existing GPU for radio astronomy computations, you will your arithmetic efficiency, your computational efficiency will only be about 10%, which means you'll have to buy 10 times uh, larger uh, uh, computer than you would otherwise. So we have to work with the vendors to improve the memory bandwidth. And there are groups of people within the SK project uh, who are doing exactly that, trying to make sure that the high performance computer that we built is optimized for uh, the arithmetic intensity that we have. So in order to do that, you have to build what uh, uh, a system where is uh, that is uh, called HPDA or high performance uh, data analytics, which is where a high performance compute system is built so that it is optimized uh, to handle the characteristics of the big data that you want to pro that you want to process. This. HPDS system must ensure that the data is available when and where it is needed. We want to ensure that CPUs are not idling, waiting for data to arrive. The data must be in fast cache when it is needed. And we need a computing framework that allows for all this. 
The SKI team, as I already mentioned, is looking at a number of prototypes. They're working directly with uh, 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 computer vendors uh, to identify systems that will work for us. Now a bit about the software. Uh, building the SK software, both the telescope manager software, which will orchestrate the operations of the telescope and the science data processing software that will process the science data is an extremely large project. The budget is about uh, 100 million euros <coughs> for software development. We will and are using professional pra practices uh, for uh, development, testing, integration, and uh, uh, deployment. And all of this has to occur with the worldwide team of developers. So for example, when we were uh, uh, doing the detailed design, uh, the, we were working in uh, the range of our time zones was 18 hours. So we had somebody in Eastern Australia and we had somebody in Vancouver in Canada uh, where the time zones are different by 18 hours. So we had to find a way of working together. Uh, we need, there are a number of uh, computing challenges, uh, some of which I described, uh, but there are such challenges in a number of areas. The software system that we deliver will not be a static system. It is going to evolve over time. It is expected that the SK telescope will be operational for at least 50 years. And during that time, multiple generations of software and hardware uh, will need to be installed, commissioned and run uh, for the smooth operation of the telescope. Uh, both the hardware and the software will be upgraded periodically, if not continuously. And the key input for development for software will be the scientific and software community that we need, uh, that we will develop within the reg regional sectors. So how are we currently organized? Uh, we have basically two, two areas of effort. On the engineering side, uh, which is uh, led primarily by NCRA, uh, we've been making major contributions to the observatory management and control system. Uh, as I already mentioned, we have a long standing collaboration uh, with partners in India, industry partners, TCS and Persistent. And we're also working with uh, our partners during the detailed design. We work with our partners in radio astronomy centers in Australia, Canada, Italy, Portugal, UK, and South Africa. And for the construction phase, we already have a new collaboration in place, uh, which will involve teams from the UK, from South Africa from Italy and Portugal, besides a large number of uh, uh, large number of teams from India. On the science side, uh, we have a consortium of about uh, 20 research institutions uh, and uh, universities, which have uh, come together to form the SK India uh, consortium. So these are mainly astronomers, radio astronomers distributed across the country. This is a map which shows uh, the various institutions uh, that are part of the SK India Science Collaboration. And we have nearly a hundred scientists uh, who are working with us from across the country. There are opportunities for collaboration. The SK construction, as I mentioned, has started in July 2021. It will take about eight years to complete. India will be the largest contributor to the observatory management and control. Uh, there's a se separate agile uh, release train, which uh, we are leading and we will uh, contribute about four scaled agile teams, as well as some members of the program team uh, who will manage the entire software operations for the observatory management and control. And we will partner with industry and academia who can provide us with engineering expertise when where India will contribute to the SK software. We are in the process of uh, preparing a EOI. Uh, so uh, uh, companies, both private and public sector companies who are interested in responding to this expression of interest. Uh, please be on the lookout within the next week or so. Uh, we expect to release 
this uh, request for uh, expression of interest. A technical committee will uh, ev evaluate the responses we receive and then shortlist uh, a number of public and private sector organizations who will then be invited to participate in the Indian effort during the construction phase. Uh, I'm going to stop here by showing you just one slide which just describes uh, some key numbers uh, associated with the SKA. Uh, I'm happy to take all the questions the, that you may have. I'll just say that if you need more information, uh, then this, uh, please look first at what are called the SK key documents. I've provided the link here below. Uh, that will, there, there are literally thousands of pages of documentation uh, there, which will uh, allow you to get a quick summary. There is an executive summary document, uh, which is only about 25 pages long. And then there is uh, a much larger construction proposal uh, which will also give you all the details that you uh, may wish to see. Uh, thank you very much. And I welcome your questions and comments. Uh, thank you, uh, Yogesh, for this uh, wonderful talk and walking us through the SKA project and the challenges in the operations, the controls, and also in the data. Uh, the, uh, talk is now open for discussions. There are, I can see a question on chat. The question is, will SK be forming VLBI networks with other low frequency arrays? If so, what scientific goals can be achieved by doing so? Yeah, Yogesh? I think everyone else is muted. Yeah. Um, are you hearing me? Hello. Hello. Yogesh, can you hear Adupaga? Okay, maybe not. Yogesh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I had. Yogesh, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, okay. I switched off my speakers. So. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. That was the yeah, so yeah. There, is a, okay. there are a few questions, Yogesh. Yeah. So there, is a, there are a few questions, Yogesh. Yes. The first one is Will SK be forming VLBI? The first one is Will SK be forming Other new frequency Sorry? Other new frequency uh, Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So the, the question is that will SK yeah. be forming so the VLPI networks? Is that will SK be forming VLPI networks? Yes. yes. So there is some echo. Uh, so there is some echo. Uh, yeah, I think if uh, I think if there are multiple people unmuted, there may be echoes. So uh, so I'll I'll mute myself uh, till the question is asked, and then mm -hmm. uh, uh, then I'll unmute and speak. Sure. So I think I've got the question. The question is, uh, will the SK be used for VLBI observations? With so other for people who don't know what these are, so With this... Uh, is that the complete question, Anupama? No, no, Yogesh. Um, the, the second part of the question is, what are the scientific goals that can be achieved through these VLBI networks? Yeah, you can go ahead with your answer. Right. So, you can go ahead. yeah, yeah, now I'll respond. Yeah. So, uh, VLBI stands for Very low, low, Large Baseline Interferometry, wherein telescopes which are located, radio receptors that are uh, uh, located thousands of kilometers away from each other, the signal from those can be combined. Uh, so, although in principle, there is nothing preventing the SKA from being used for VLBI observations, uh, and it will be used to some extent for such observations. <clears throat> it is not likely to uh, be a major component of the, uh, of the SKA uh, time allotment because the SKA is a, is a standalone uh, large facility by itself. Uh, trying to combine that uh, with other facilities will give you an improvement in the resolution, 
but that is not always required for most uh, for many scientific problems so so it is clear that maybe a part of the sk could be used for uh, being participating in a vlbi network uh, with other telescope located in other continents but it's not going to be used uh, in that mode at all and uh, it can't be used with each other the two S, uh, sk telescopes won't do vlbi with each other because they operate at completely different uh, frequency bands okay so they don't operate they can't observe at the same frequency so they won't be used uh, they won't be uh, intra sk vlbi vlbi can be done with other facilities uh, elsewhere uh, but it's not going to uh, it's not going to be a major company. Okay, uh, there's another question by Kushi Arora. There's another question. And the question is, will SK help us in understanding about black holes? Uh, yes. So, uh, definitely, most definitely, the SK will be a very powerful machine uh, for studying uh, uh, black holes. Uh, it will be... Uh, particularly uh, useful for studying the supermassive black holes that reside uh, in the centers of galaxies. But uh, certainly uh, black holes uh, within our galaxy, which have uh, uh, formed accretion disks and so on, and which can emit within the radio bands can also be studied. So we can study stellar mass black holes within our galaxy, and we can study uh, uh, active galaxies or supermassive black holes in at the cores of galaxies in uh, thousands of uh, galaxies outside our own. Okay. Um, second question from uh, Pranav. Oh, second Maya. question from uh, uh, wants to know uh, whether the growing field of quantum computing will be helpful in handling SKA data. Uh, yes, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we don't know what the progress rate of commercially available quantum computing is going to be. What's the timeline? What's the projection? What's uh, the expected cost and so on. So at the present time, although uh, the project uh, uh, maintains a close look at emerging technologies like quantum computing, uh, the planning does not involve that. The plan is to go in for uh, conventional computers uh, because we will need them within seven or eight years. Uh, however, in the future, as and when quantum computing becomes uh, technically and economically viable, uh, definitely we'll be able to do it. And since the telescope is going to run for at least 50 years, I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunities to incorporate new technologies as we go along. Okay. Um, another set of questions from Kushi Arora again. She wants to understand how the data from the SK telescope are stored and also whether there'll be an opportunity for cit citizen scientists help in analysis of the data sets. And she also wants to understand what are the pathfinders and precursors in SK. So let me take one at a time. <coughs> How will the data be stored? Uh, it will be stored uh, in a large network attached storage systems. So at the moment, we feel that uh, we will be using, uh, at least for most of the real time data in the science data processor, as well as in the SK regional centers, most of the data will be stored in uh, hard disks. So it will be, of course, uh, complicated uh, hard disk storage based uh, storage system. Uh, as far as, uh, what was the second part of this question? This is whether uh, there'll be opportunity for whether, uh, there'll be opportunity for analysis and- yeah. uh, So for yeah, citizen yeah. science, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So the data volumes are going to be so large uh, that it will be completely infeasible for individual astronomers uh, to deal with that volume of data. And there will be a number of uh, citizen science projects 
uh, that can be carried out with the SK data. At least in the early years, most of the time of the SK telescope will be devoted to large surveys. So there will be enormous amounts of survey data and there will be uh, uh, citizen science projects, uh, perhaps along the lines of Radio Galaxy Zoo or something completely different uh, that will be made available to citizen scientists uh, across the world uh, for them to uh, help us, help the astronomers uh, deal with this prodigious quantities of data. See, we, we are talking of 100, uh, we're talking of in the SRCs uh, together ingesting about 600 petabytes every year. So definitely citizen science will play an important role. Yeah, and the last question was, um, what are pathfinders and precursors in SK? So uh, uh, SK, uh, what they've done is that they've defined a number of pathfinders. So that list of pathfinders is quite large. Pathfinders are telescopes that have recently undergone an upgrade and therefore new technologies that will be used in, the SK, in building the SK have been tried and tested in these telescopes. So for example, the GMRT, the upgraded GMRT is a SK pathfinder uh, because we have used, for example, the, the same monitoring and control uh, system technology wise that we want to build for the SK, we've built a prototype, a smaller version uh, using the same technology stack, but we built it to operate the GMRT. And that will now, that experience will be carried forward while building it for the SK. The precursors, on the other hand, are telescopes that are located on the site and uh, have uh, are very useful because uh, things like the data logistics, roads, power, network, everything has already been set up for these precursors like ASCAP, Meerkat and MWA. And therefore, uh, we'll be, uh, they will form, they will give sort of real life site experience of uh, what, what it's like to operate at that site. And so these things are uh, co-located at the telescope at the two telescope sites and therefore they're providing us with a lot of uh, inf useful information even things like what is the uh, rfi the radio frequency interference uh, uh, at each of those sites because these sites are already in use uh, we have been able to monitor the the radio frequency interference at the sites for the last decade or so and therefore, we have very accurate data. We, we know exactly what to expect when we build the SK. Okay, um, Kushi has another question, but let me see if there are any questions from the viewers on YouTube, and then we can come back to that question later. Uh, no, on YouTube, you, uh, we don't have any questions. Okay. Okay, in that case, we can take uh, uh, the other question on, um, she wants to understand how the ideas um, that people have, for example, she wants to, you know, she thinks she has some plans to make it convenient with the help of quantum computing and would like to understand how to submit these ideas in the form of research papers, particularly to um, SKA. So I think this will require a bit of thinking. Uh, so Kushi, what I encourage you to uh, just Google my name, you'll be able to find my email address. Uh, please contact me directly, send me an email and uh, I will see how we can take, uh, take this forward. Okay. So I don't see any more questions in the chat box here. So, Okay, I think uh, that's it uh, regarding the questions. So once again, let's thank the uh, speaker, uh, Yogesh, for this wonderful 
talk and the very interesting uh, discussions we had. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yogis. And on behalf of Pune Knowledge Cluster, uh, Codata National Committee, and Indian National Science Academy, INSA, I thank uh, you for joining today for the talk. And I also thank all the participants, the chair for the session, Dr. Anupama. Thank you so much. Thank you all.